This is Kerstin and Chris, and they will um, introduce themselves somewhat, so um, I leave this out. But they will speak about uh, how to connect uh, data protection and cybersecurity, who often fight against each other in a lot of situations <laughs> uh, in the reality. But they show us how to connect them well so the data is protected better than if they work um, yeah, alone. Have fun with Preach It, Don't Breach It, Cybersecurity and Data Protection as Partner in Crime. Hi. And <laughs> So, uh, yeah, hi, it's me, it's Chris. I'm uh, the techie side of this talk. So, yeah, I'm working with emergency response teams for like over seven years in large enterprises, namely for Siemens and now for SAP. So, yeah, I've seen all the attacks from ransomware APTs to really like stupid stuff like Bitcoin miners and stuff being installed on servers. So, I've seen it all from a technical side, but what is actually new since two and a half years for me is like this close collaboration with lawyers like uh -huh. Kerstin, because we are now kind of approaching an area where, yeah, cloud security, you have a lot of data from people in there and suddenly things that are non-technical get interesting and then you sit there as a tech in like, what? <laughs> the lawyers want me to what? For why? Okay. <laughs> and this is why we decided to also kind of have this talk together to kind of highlight what we do and the collaboration between those two fields. And yeah, I'm, a I'm the techie side of things. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I'm the legal side of things. So um, as was already mentioned at the beginning, it's mostly a love-hate relationship. So, <laughs> And even we fight sometimes. When I just remember two weeks ago, we just were fighting about email access. Yeah, Because <laughs> it's not, a, not only about kind of personal data breaches, it's about how you prepare to mitigate how you then execute the whole thing if something really goes down the drain and how do you clean everything up? Because sometimes cybersecurity is quite greedy, specifically with regards to log files and what they want to scan. And we are the opposite. We say like protecting the people, data minimization principle, all this kind of stuff. So it gets definitely interesting. Yeah, the most easy th um, easy challenge for, for example, everybody of us understands is like phishing. Like you receive one phishing email. If you receive one and you know about one, you can bet your butt on it that there are thousands more that didn't report it so how to get them without accessing the email uh, inboxes of people exactly super hard super hard <laughs> and then you're in this thing you're, oh you're accessing the email things what about facebook what about oh god yeah here we go yeah <laughs> or if you're working in a company where private usage is allowed so it's completely fine if you surf during your working hours or if you use your um, company email address for doing kind of day-to-day -day stuff yeah? then it gets even more complicated yeah and I think for me, I'm working for si I think seven years now as well um, with data protection privacy. I'm a lawyer, um, studied in Germany and Sweden, and um, but I really like it. And I haven't seen it all by now. I would say there's still something out there I haven't seen. So still interesting. Yeah, that's basically a problem statement. That, like, what are we talking about? Why is it important? Um, we want to kind of touch like the basics of uh, personal data breaches and risk assessment stuff and also like sh like show a bit of how we work with an incident response like this firefighting stuff how does that work in companies like that are really large uh, because they're, we're not doing it in a random space we are actually following a pattern even if it seems random from the outside sometimes but there's actually plan behind it and there is like links to um to cyber le uh, to legal teams all the time in every phase of our reaction as a company to cyber threats. And yes, it's not, hopefully not that boring as it sounds at the beginning. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, it's like a riddle. You get presented a quite exciting case, which sometimes is horrific and you have to solve it under time pressure. You just need every information you can get to do the legal assessment, to do the technical assessment, to contain it, to get the bad guys out and all this kind of stuff. So we have a process, which is definitely, otherwise it's chaos. But I think there's a lot of freestyle still. And you yeah. have to like it if you're working under pressure and all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, uh, you will burn out. You know the shit time. storms on social media that yes. hits the investigation teams as well, because sometimes the investigation teams don't know more, more than the initial start as well. But there is no time. People are kind of completely crashing the communication. Like there's a big flood of communication going on, and we have to kind of present stuff. But you have no idea what actually happened. So yeah. So um, is everybody familiar what personal data is? Here, just okay. Oh, that's good. 
<laughs> but I mean, I'm just speaking from the European perspective. Yeah? So in Europe, personal data is quite a lot. Um, when I talk to my US colleagues, for example, they were always like, it's only the business email address. Come on, is this really personal? Yes, it is personal data. I'm really sorry, yes. An IP address could be personal data. Your um, number of your company um, mobile phone is personalized because it traces back to you. So it's everything where you can really identify somebody directly or indirectly. Um, so for example, here in this room, if you say, okay, a woman um, with, I would say, a bit larger trousers, um, light blue, in this room, I would be identified by that. So it really depends on the context. Yeah? So here you have to be specifically, if you're working on a, in a global context, be very, very precise because sometimes people really don't understand what we are talking about. And the same goes for the definition of a personal data breach. So it's, of course, a breach of security, but what does this mean? And I have two examples afterwards which will showcase what this actually is, which leads to unlawful accidental destruction, that's clear, loss, alteration, disclosure and access. Even looking at data is access. It's not like grabbing the data and doing something with the data. No, it's really looking at it because the processing definition, at least under GPR, is super broad. I always get asked, yeah, but they only access the data. They didn't do anything. It's still processing. Yeah, so it still falls under the definition. So that's kind of the baseline we are operating on. And according to these definitions, um, specifically in Europe, you have notification requirements sometimes to the data protection authorities or to you as individuals, for example, if your credit card data gets leaked or your health data or anything about your sexual preference or your political beliefs, which are really heavy stuff for some people. And why? Because data protection is about protecting you, not the data. It's about the person behind the data. Next slide. And here, this is how we do it, <laughs> at least under GEPR. So depending on the risk, there are different notification requirements. Sometimes something happens, we say, okay, there is a very low medium risk. We mitigate it, fine, we can close the case, we just have to document it. But if there's really a high risk or a very high risk for you behind the data, then we have to take additional actions. And how do we define or make the legal assessment if some, something is high risk? So just imagine you have different categories of data, like your email address, your personal email address, your business email address, um, your home address, um, credit card data, all the stuff I mentioned before, political beliefs, sexual orientation, these fall into different buckets of criticality. And depending on what kind of data categories are affected, we make this assessment. And then, of course, it makes a difference if um, it was malicious. So if we have outside attackers who are saying, like, I just want to crack the system and look at everybody's data and just want to sell it on the dark web. Or I want to make the most, I will inflict the most harm possible on all the people here. Or if it was an internal researcher who has no other hobbies than hacking into solutions just to crack all the little security gaps which are there and then diligently tell us, okay, here something went wrong, could you please fix it? It really makes a difference for the risk assessment. And then of course, is the data publicly available? So if you post specific categories about yourself for everybody available in the internet, it's less critical than if we are talking about your health data, which resides with your doctor. So it really makes a difference. And if you combine different data, and if you have more data categories in one incident, it makes it, of course, more critical. And if you have a high risk, we go to the Data Protection Authority and just say, okay, this happens, mitigation measures, blah, blah, blah. And if it's a very high risk, then we have to tell you. And why? Because sometimes, the so-called data controller, so the entity who is responsible for the data processing, who is setting the purpose and the means, cannot help. I cannot block your credit card. It's only you. You can block your credit card. You have to take action. And that's the reason behind it's all about the person behind the data. Next slide, please. Ah, just, uh, genau, noch mal. Um, I think that's a very good example. It's a bit older. So GPR was not yet enforced, but the fine 
was um, they, they got fined when GDPR was in force afterwards and the UK was still uh, part of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Back really cool day. because I really had in-depth discussion with my security colleagues if a programming bug is really um, a security breach. Because normally you say, okay, uh, I don't know, the door was open or you didn't follow the this and that protocol, state of the art is security, blah, blah, blah. No, but really a um, software bug could be a security breach because it was not developed in a proper way. It was not tested in a proper way. And um, in the company we are working, we have a secure development life cycle with specific product requirements and they have to test it. Yeah, so I think it makes sense if a programming bug really is um, a security breach. And here, I think really interesting example, um, there was a programming bug which, and which really rendered private profiles public. And you all know Twitter, for some people this could be a life and death decision specifically if you are working in very critical areas, etc., etc., It makes sense to keep your, your circle very small. And yeah, they didn't mitigate it. They did not take this really seriously. And that's the reason why they got fined. And they failed to notify the breach on time. I don't know, they took, I think, several months to tell the Data Protection Authority, which is not okay. Yeah, so that's the first example. And the second one, that's a really good one as well. Can you buy that click? Yeah, that's a bank and um, there was one employee of the bank who still had access to all the data despite no longer working for the bank and I really like the attitude of Santander Bank like we don't care, we just don't care, we won't notify, we did not notify, we will never notify <laughs> and so they got fined as well. And I mean here it was of course a major intrusion for the data subjects affected because this guy was able to manipulate the financial data and they just didn't take it seriously. So, yeah, two fun cases. Yeah, now about the techie part of it, that's the scary part with all the fines and stuff and why enterprises really take it serious uh, by now that like you have to notify and you have to understand what happen what happens. That also puts us in the firefighting units in the emergency response teams on a more pressure because like the clock is ticking, the shitstorm is approaching and we have to kind of deal with all the stuff we have to dealt, where we dealt with before, but now under like the looking glass on the board usually kind of ring the phone every hour. Is there any news? Is there any news? What happened? We need to kind of file it. We need to understand. Oh, God. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, burning us a bit out. <laughs> Firefighting got more intense with that. So what happens if something gets detected in a large enterprise is always the same. It's not, it may seem random because you always start with a little puzzle piece, right? There's a darknet posting claiming that your database got popped. Yeah, which one of those 500,000 that we have, you know? You always start with these little puzzle pieces, and that's the scheme we kind of usually uh, apply when kind of following up. The pre preparation phase is the first one, that's pretty easy, that's, this, that, that's when nothing happens, you pre just prepare yourself for emergencies. You, like the firefighters, would probably polish their cars and, you know, look at all the maintenance stuff they have to do. The same is it for emergency response teams in the cyber world. It's us updating the ticket systems, ensuring that our life cycle works, doing tabletops, you know, stuff that you do when there is no crisis mode. Then it gets into detection analysis. So in the ideal case, we would love to detect stuff before it gets posted in the dark web, right? We want to kind of see stuff before it happens, before somebody else knows about it. We want to kind of be able to stop it immediately ASAP. So you have heard about seams and stuff like uh, big vacuum cleaners that kind of suck up every lock in the company, crunch it together, and you have like rules that you detect stuff on, like the most easiest would be, oh look, that database server is only kind of serving one gigabyte per day, now it's five. That's odd. Let's have a look, right? That's the most simple thing you can think of. But it also gets more complex, like with yeah, Stuxnet, right? You're doing passive DNS and stuff, but there you also see the link to Kerstin. If I have passive DNS, I know who kind of browsed to which website pretty much, like who resolved which domain name in the company. That's also kind of stuff. Imagine Madison Ashley or all these like little sites that you don't want your colleagues to know that you are serving on them. Not nice. So uh, the next phase is the containment, a prediction recovery phase. That's the actual firefighting. That's like, oh, we know what, what happened. Okay, let's kind of got to the action plan. Let's pull out this, the plugs of that server. Let's do this, let's yeah, get the backups, let's scan them, let's set it up again. That kind of that phase is there to kind of put everything back to normal from the firefighting, from the fire, actually to putting the fire out. That's probably the best analogy here. 
And then the post-event activity, that's the stuff that happens um, when you just kind of, you know, everything kind of come back to a normal mode and you sit down, take a breath and like, what worked? Oh God, those guys from data privacy, we had a big fight, two hour calls and it was still not clear what to do and who, who kind of, yeah, what we have to do and what we delivered was not worth, yeah, was not for them to take in and stuff. So we also sit down and that's the most important phase after every crisis, we also sit down and kind of work and kind of get tasks for the preparation phase. Like we have to get them access, we have to write the reports properly, we have to do this and that. We forgot to, lo to onboard logs from data center in whatever, in uh, Montevideo in South America. We should, them, we should get these logs in so the next time we can uh, react quicker. That's usually the stuff that happens there. Preparation, as I said, it's the most important phase. Um, the meme is not kidding, that's how it starts, right? There was some post, somebody claimed something somewhere. That's usually how it starts and then you kind of start digging. Like, okay, <laughs> what's the data? Which server? <laughs> what is it all about? Is it true? Is it somebody just trolling around? Do we have a problem or is that person just kind of bullshitting people? You never know, it happens all. <laughs> yeah, and for us, like the most important learnings here, working with the lawyer side is like, they ha we have to get them access to, the, to everything. We have case notes and stuff, right? So we have like a ticketing system, you can call it, where all the investigation stuff, forensics, everything kind of is in there, right? You open the case and you have everything the company knows about that particular case. A timeline, logs that are relevant, everything. And for us, the big learning was those guys, they need access to it in like fully transparent way. They need to kind of deep dive. But we don't needed. get it. That was our problem. I mean, we yeah. are not technical people. I would say I understand quite a lot, but not, I mean, I'm not the expert, definitely not. So you had to translate quite, quite mm -hmm. a bit. And uh, yeah, this was fun at the beginning because we just did not understand each other at all. Super simple things, right? So for us, it's clear that there's a quant shop and what it is and stuff, yeah. and there's a log and yeah, well, that's a HTTP log. It's easy, that's a refer, that's super easy. That's IP, that's because it's a behind the load balancer, super trivial stuff, yalla yalla. Hard to translate for lawyers. <laughs> so and for us, what? Yeah, it was really a learning that we have, like what we really teach our people is like, we have to write high level, Kindergarten summaries, that's also good because we also we, we also push it up to the board. They have the same level sometimes, right? They need really easy, understandable stories when they kind of get approached by the press. You can't tell them about load balancers, reverse book. They don't need to know about that. You have to write it in a way they can ingest and understand what happened and how bad it is and in which context it happened. And this is for us like the lessons learned, like we have to be able to do this translation. So at the very top of these cases, you will find a little summary like with six or seven sentences most describing the case in a really kindergarten manner. Like, no technical phrases at all at the beginning. And then we are torturing you as well, because we need yeah. very specific information, what we have to put in our legal assessment, like timeline um, and all the stuff I showed you at the beginning was assessing the criticality, like data categories. And here I think we are still in the kind of, yeah, <laughs> develop of a better privacy culture it, so that the people really understand what's relevant or what is really personal data. Like I mentioned before, business email address. I think your US colleagues like, yeah, no biggie, what's yeah. the problem? Yeah, I have a problem, it's personal because, data. Because, yeah, it depends on GDPR or not and yeah. which country was relevant. Like, was it US persons being affected in the US restriction? Then business email address is not a big part. Is it Europeans? It's, it's different. different, it's GDPR hitting in. So at the context really matters and for us that was also a big learning we had to kind of suddenly kind of deal with all this like who's affected, where did it happen, <laughs> yeah, that's, that gets relevance now. And don't get exa or if you dump, so if you have a data dump, please not the whole apartment with 100 people accessing the data dump. Two are enough to doing the analysis because that is a bit critical from a DPP perspective as yeah. well. And then what we also did is tabletops. Um, we really kind of sat down and played, uh, played a bit of like exercises to kind of understand, okay, if I now shovel that stuff over, does it work? And, they are, and that kind of helps you to kind of, you know, yeah. take a laugh and stuff and have a sip of coffee with your colleagues without all this crisis mode, that kind of the panic that happens around you and the fire that kind of helps to kind of, you know, develop the process a bit. So you have like a try run, you can laugh at mistakes because it's funny, you know, we taught them about IPs, they had no idea what we are talking about, ha <laughs> ha, yeah. <laughs> then you can fix it without pressure. That was super helpful. Oh. And also, 
like one of our biggest challenges, but that's not uh, DPP related, data privacy related. That's a standard thing for, for all the incident response teams. You have to know your king kingdom. If there's some databases or some servers that nobody told you about and there's no asset inventory or something, you are pretty much blind and that by kind of delays your response by at least days if if it's really bad month or weeks because there was some server that nobody told you about, nobody's access, they kind of rented something somewhere, but it still like belongs to the company and you're responsible, but nobody has any clue about it because the person who kind of rented it was on like parental leave for two months. Yeah, cool. And something happened on the server. Nice. <laughs> That's yeah, one of the most important lectures in incident response yeah, at all. You have to know the kingdom you're protecting. And that's something I tell my younger colleagues when they are coming in and want to learn something about kind of mitigating personal, personal data breaches. Um, keep your expectations low. Um, it will build up over time, yeah, specifically the, the information we get for our case assessment. It won't be there at day one. It will take sometimes a week, sometimes more. It's still the investigation phase. Yeah? So keep your expectations low. You can tell them 100 things you need, but they are doing their best. And it's just, we are a team. And we should not fight each other in such kind of a situation. It's just, um, we can only do it together. So keep your expectations just low. Yep. Yeah, that's what we had. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this quote here, um, I have in my Microsoft Teams profile, because I think it's so compelling yeah um, insufficient facts always invites danger we need the real facts to assess the case and if you don't give me the full picture i cannot give you a proper legal analysis and everything what i will do is wrong so i need from my friends from cybersecurity precise information and it of course it can change over time but when i do the assessment when we file a report when we reach out to our people who are m potentially affected they want to know the truth so we really need the facts, and only the facts. Yeah, that's basically us. Um, also, kind of not taking data privacy super, um, you know, super important on our plate. Um, when I look at like our uh, SOCs, like the Secure Operations Center teams, they have detections and stuff. We talk about like NTDS uh, and NTDS .dit and stuff. That's the pa funny part. That's the techie part. We understand that, but we often lack these detections for. Yeah, privacy, data privacy cases, like like the standard stuff, like is there abnormal amount, is there like traffic that we kind of didn't expect from from servers? Because somebody kind of probably kind of dumped the whole database or the whole stuff. That stuff we are always like, I always see as a big gap in our detection stuff as well, in our detections, because we always focus on the techie parts and being the stuff that we understand, but we never focus on this metadata stuff, meta level. Mm -hmm. And uh, the coolest thing I've seen so far is like canary tokens in, the, in personal inf uh, identifi identifiable in information. Like you have probably a user that isn't used at all, but that user is unique per database. So when you see a dump in the darknet and you get the dump, you see which database it belongs. And you know like, oh, freaking heck, that's production database and that's actually that shit. We have to hit the red button now without even analyze, anali analyzing it further. So that's the coolest stuff I've seen. We are not there as well. <laughs> that's light years from from uh, from us at the moment. But that's what what we the advanced players kind of do. They kind of drop in little watermarks, you could so to say, to these important data uh, blocks. And when they see the watermarks somewhere, they can identify like, oh, that's bad. And we know it's bad because that database that the watermark is only known to us. Those canaries. Yeah. And uh, yeah, once we know what happened, actually, like the analysis phase is done, we kind of identify what happened, whatever, there's a database injection, SQL injection, whatever, somebody dumped the database, and now it's out there. And we can identify the stuff. We have to kind of, well, our learnings from the techie side was, we have to understand, we have to kind of get them the visibility on the content of the data, right? Usually kind of for us, it doesn't matter, it's like a database, what, doesn't matter what it, what it holds, right? It's the same technical stuff, it's a database. And somebody kind of downloaded everything with a select star. <laughs> Boring stuff. But <laughs> for lawyers, it's important to it's know important. the fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah for Like, sure. was, it, was it your health data? Was it like, was, was it genders in there? Was it just email addresses? Was it like somebody ordering Raspberry Pis or somebody getting his paycheck with the little 
bank details attached to it and stuff. Mm. That gets relevant and we have to translate those SQL stuff also to our colleagues from Cyber Legal. It's not good enough to tell them, look, there's the table, do whatever you like. That's the SQL table, have fun, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then <laughs> so you don't have any fun. Yeah, we have to translate it and we also have to help it. So what we also do is like, we also prepare examples like war data and show them like, look, this is how it looks like, don't get scared. This is what it means. <laughs> that's the telephone number, we kind of, we did a few tests, I think that's the I account name because that's a unique one per row. And that's, so you kind of explain the data a bit, but it's additional work for the incident response team to translate that from the technical side to a human readable side. And sometimes we often also do like a bit of vetting. So um, for example, when there are email addresses and it's your company email addresses, we often also kind of run additional checks like, is it old? Like, are those email addresses still existing? That's easy. It's LW, right? It's for us, it's not a hard thing to kind of script it and script that kind of goes there and kind of ticks everything that is uh, not existing anymore. But that helps our our, per, our legal parts to kind of get the context of is is it something that was scrambled together by putting all data together and kind of making it look interesting, or is it actually something recent with 99% of these email addresses still existing, or is it 60% of email addresses are gone? Not reachable anymore, it's all data, who cares? Mm. Yeah, not that critical, not who cares, but not that critical at least. Yeah, true. And don't forget the product side. Yeah. I mean, we have talked about a lot of data <laughs> dumps and access, but yeah. if you have a problem in your products, and for example, your data fields are scrambled, and there's a mix of Chris's and my data, so I get Chris's salary, or, or vice versa, yeah, this is a problem as well, because this could qualify as well as a personal data breach. So it's not only about disclosure, it's about deletion. So if my um, bank account details are deleted before my paycheck run, I don't get my money. And who, who pays my rent? I, I cannot, I don't have money in my bank account. So it's not only accessing, dumping data, it's much more unfortunately. And one thing I remember doing as often is also like going the extra mile sometimes for the lawyers, like also looking for stuff that didn't usually incident response is reactive, right? Something happened, you jump on it, you put the fire out, fine, that's it. But often you have like, for example, if there's SQL injection, right? Somebody played with it. We kind of, we look for data dumps, but if like, we could also kind of go the extra mile sometimes and see if like, okay, technically that with that vulnerability, you could also kind of alter the data and edit stuff. Are we sure nobody did it? And that's the guy who reported us the first time kind of seeing it. So yeah. that's often also the extra mile that we go since working with, with, with uh, the data privacy guys because we are kind of, you know, usually this incident response stuff is like vulnerability closed, thing handled, um. that's it. But often we kind of go the extra mile there and kind of like ensure that nothing happened and we can safely say this is the case and nothing else happened. Yeah. But would you say that your job has changed over the last four years, five years? Yeah, Can a bit. Yeah. yeah, so that comes from more techie to like get get rid of my problems, you techie guys in the basement, to <laughs> tell us what happened mm, <laughs> at okay. board level. Meeting is at, that's the invite, yeah. yeah and I think the legal <laughs> aspects definitely as well, yeah. because what we see is that the privacy landscape changes. We have more and more laws upcoming right now, and many of them are just mimicking the GDPR. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look, for example, at China, the law is completely different, but with regards to the scope, they have the same extraterritorial scope as GPR. Yeah, so they are really copying and pasting um, the laws. So it's not only like Europe is the hot topic, but um, we have similar laws um, in APJ with even personal liability sometimes of people responsible for the data processing. And yeah, so I think it will even change more in the future. I hope not, but yeah, let's see. <laughs> So the post-incident, uh, post-event activity, yeah, as I said, hiccups happen. Ultimately, important, like the really important thing is that you trust each other and don't start fighting because you always have a fight. Usually, the panic going on. You have this, you know, this meme where there's one guy sitting at the table drinking coffee and everything is burning around him. That's usually how it, how it looks in incident response. You have to be calm, and if you, if you fight in the teams in the company, also, it kind of it goes to hell. Like you have to trust each other and just rely on each other and don't kind of take a breath sometimes. Things get a few, <laughs> a bit emotional at times when, they, when people are under, are under pressure, that happens. But it's super important that you establish trust and that you drink a beer with, with your lawyers and stuff and that you can, you know, that you kind of work together and collaborate even in these tense times. Because yeah, 
that's really, really important. And hiccups happen every time. There is no process or no relationship that works every time. It's perfectly normal to fail. Even in this like panic situation, don't kind of, you know, like <laughs> talk about the, the failures in the incident response time. In the incident response, that's like when that's for after, right? Focus is kind of getting the emergency done, getting all the informations together, <laughs> getting back to normal work times, work hours, and then we can talk about what went, went wrong and what kind of completely went off the track. No, that's true. And don't forget, I mean, I would say our groups are, are very different from the characters working in there. So this is something as well. <laughs> Just how you present yourself, how you talk to each other, it is different. So I think there, it's a learning process. And if you're ever working in cybersecurity or a lawyer want to work closer with security, I think it's fun. I really like it. But my colleagues sometimes like, oh strange. I say, yeah, but <laughs> this is how it is if you work with different teams. Not everybody is, yeah, a lawyer. It's, it's just, just how it is. <laughs> it's really different areas. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and that's incident response post-event activities from a DPP perspective. So what I, I always say to Chris, like, delete the stuff, please. It's not my precious. You want to keep it? Delete it. You need a purpose, you need a legal basis to keep it, you need to define a retention period for your logs, you need to, you, you must delete the stuff after, I don't know, five years. When the case is really closed, there are no legal claims, please delete it. Yeah? And there are also data subject rights. So all of you can ask a data controller, give me information about what data do you processing about me. Yeah? A full list, a full copy, it's your right, it's in the law, no problem. But we have a problem if we have too much data lying around there, because then we have a lot of work to answering all these requests. And this is a love-hate relationship, really, because I think here we are clashing a bit. Yeah, of course, I want to keep that stuff, because when the guy comes back, I want yeah. to know what happened before, because he might act the same way, people repeat itself. I want to kind of understand, like, l how did we find out that was that, like, that IP address the last time? How, how, how was it again? So I really want to go back to these cases, usually, and want to kind of read up what we did because I forget about it, like a year later, I have no idea how we ex like in detail did it. Yeah, so there was a cl clash of things here. <laughs> but you have to find a balance. Yep. And I always say like data protection is not black and white. It's a risk-based approach and you have a lot of gray. That's it. Yeah. And I think that's our last slide. Yep. I'm not suffering from post-incident <laughs> blues, not at all. I don't know why our cybersecurity colleagues are suffering from it, but I am hell really relieved when it's over because I have deadlines like 72 hours without undue delay and I really enjoy my weekends without any <laughs> crazy cases. Yeah. I mean, I like you and your team, but sometimes I have definitely <laughs> enough. <laughs> so. <laughs> One yeah. thing that we have probably to mention, uh, what we need to mention is like, um, if you ever see the companies reacting slow, the, the time clock starts ticking at the moment an enterprise understands the data privacy violation. So we can tell like this is actually a data privacy violation. Becoming aware of the Exactly, bridge. yeah. It doesn't start with the posting in, in the darknet and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to understand. So because like somebody posted it, like it might be that I get hold of it like a week later because that port is closed and not easily reachable. And somebody has to tell me about it and stuff. So yeah, just in case the next shitstorm is approaching and people like enterprises are reacting slow, that's probably because of it. Like we, you need to give the teams a bit of time to kind of understand yes. what happened before we tell you anything because like otherwise we would tell you a lie. And that would be worse. <laughs> exactly, yeah. because there's this kind of notification fatigue as well. Just imagine you get five emails a, a week saying like your data was breached. And every time it was like not really critical, something was like, ah, you can handle this by yourself. And sometimes you just, you will delete these emails for sure after a year or so when you're getting five per week. Yeah. And it's a so-called investigation phase. And it's also in the law that you have a bit of time just to understand what happened. I think that's, that's it, it, I guess. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now it works, I guess. Hello? 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 Dann nehme ich das andere erstmal wieder. Äh, ja, erstmal danke, Chris und äh, Kerstin. Ähm, mich hat, mir hat es sehr viel Spaß gemacht, weil ich habe tatsächlich sowohl einen Legal als auch einen IT-Hintergrund. <lacht> Aber das dürfte den meisten hier im Publikum, glaube ich, nicht so gegangen sein. Ähm, habt ihr Fragen?
thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. Um, in, in, at the moment, in uh, cybersecurity, the most important thing is to collect data <laughs> very long in history in order to come over when an incident happens. So this is, of course, a conflict, <laughs> I think, to the data protection side. How you handle it? Um, we have data retention times, right, that we agreed on. So, um, but that also goes hand in hand with a, with a statement saying, like, we can only tell you that nothing happened during the last three years, two years, whatever your data retention time is. If something happened before, I, maybe, I don't know. So that's, like, same side of the thing, right? Same yeah, side yeah. of the metal. And I mean, now everybody asks, yeah, okay, retention times, how long? Five years, 10 years, that's a problem because the law says nothing. It says as long as there's a purpose and as long as you have a legal basis. Um, I always say like, okay, do we have, for example, any like NIST, do we have a standard, an industry practice which really helps us? Do we have specific technical measures to secure the data, like hot storage, cold storage, access concepts? Can we maybe pseudonymize the data, hash it properly? Um, is it even possible to anonymize it? I mean, you don't need, I don't know, every single data category which is personal. Maybe you need, I don't know, server logs without any personal data in it. So it really depends. I think you find workarounds, but you have to look your, yeah, you have to look your partner in the eye and say, okay, let's, let's be real, what you really need, what makes sense and just find middle ground. It's not easy. And it really depends where you're headquartered as well. Yep. So, I think a US company is different than a European based company. Don't forget that. Yeah. Who makes the decision? Uh, the question was who makes the decision for when it's. Data retention. How long it's stored? Usually it's us kind of proposing the standard and DPP has to sign it off. So the data privacy lawyers kind of sign it off or refuse to sign it. Then we kind of fight again and kind of lower the, the, <laughs> the retention time. But like it's us in the technical side kind of pulling the stories. Like for email, for example, because of the phishing going on and the, the big threat. And yeah, yeah. for all the for the, all the enterprise, we, we have a really easy way to kind of I'd like tell, tell Kerstin like, Look, we've had 568 cases, wow. 2,560 affected employees. We need to keep that data for five years or something, right? So it's us building the story and then kind of convincing her that this is okay. Or our DPO, <laughs> not only yeah. me. Yeah, but I mean, and on the other hand, you just ha have to spin a very uh, good story, to be honest. It's all about documentation in data protection law. Document it properly, have good arguments, have it properly secured with technical and organizational measures. I mean, if such kind of data leaks is not ideal, yeah, but if you say like the whole process is there, you have a good story, it's documented, I really don't see a data protection authority coming in and raiding your building and just like delete it, no. I mean, they have need to understand it and if you have a proper story, it's in my opinion, it must be fine. Otherwise, how should enterprises protect themselves? Not possible. There's then probably also the actual legal side that you could uh, actually make a case before a court yes. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oops. Uh, it depends if there was really a case with people affected, customers affected, etc. You have to keep the data, of course, as evidence proof that you acted correctly. Yeah. How about the classical case of my uh, long-term tape backup of the email server? I cannot tell anybody uh, we have deleted your old email, your private data, but it is in the tape. Nobody m should access it, but in case of emergency. Mm, that works, but it's the same story. Um, it doesn't matter how you access it. So yeah, there are logs like that for like that are not easily reachable and searchable for us. We keep them somewhere else because we don't need them very often, right? So we know we need them in real emergencies like when it that when it's that or that category but it doesn't matter right like legally wise it doesn't matter whether you keep them on tape or not it's completely irrelevant for the for the privacy side they are there and therefore you can access it it might take you a week to kind of get your hands on it but it doesn't matter if it takes so you one hour a week to delete all his mail? if someone uh, a former employee ah, tells mean, me ah. to delete all mail i can't it's in the backup yeah Okay, then you're talking about data subject rights, again, the deletion, mm -hmm. and then it depends on the work relationship. Is there, for example, a litigation case pending before the labor court? 
this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there might be reasons why you have to keep the data. If you only have the reasons like, I cannot reach it because our technical setup sucks, not a good reason. <laughs> as easy as that, unfortunately. There was another question. I have just a small question. Thanks for the talk at first. Um, how do you rate the services like a external uh, cert for small to medium sized businesses which may do not have a proper documentation and varying experts on the topic which aren't that deep within your company processes? How we rate them in general um, is better than nothing. But of course I'm working like in-house so I think that's, uh, well, would say different right i think it's worth the money because like but it's also expensive right but you understand like the process of tech you have this like company background you can easily uh, talk you can easily talk to people you are sitting there you know who's working where and you know why things are happening that way which that knowledge kind of there is no way you have that knowledge as an external out as an external vendor right you, you there was one customer and there were like 50 of them and you don't have the time to kind of you know deep dive into each and every company and kind of assess like stuff like that so but we have these backup solutions on tapes how's that like <laughs> yeah well external vendors don't care it's one service but it's better than nothing right better having something that is there for you to help than nothing at all that's the first kind of situation no answer from the legal side <laughs> any more questions this is the last question I take. Um, I was wondering uh, if you came up with a four-step process yourselves, <laughs> or is that something, or where did you get the inspiration for it? Um, incidents. Um, something happened, and we knew that this was actually kind of something we should talk with the privacy guys about it, and then it started. So there, there was no process at all at the beginning. It just kind of came over us. <laughs> We had the case in front of us, and we were like, freaking heck, what to do now? <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, for example, the ENISA, the European Cybersecurity Agency, that's more or less industry standard, these four steps, I would say, isn't it? And it's oh, the incident response stuff, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's what we are talking about, is like additionally to this standard, like incident response is always like a technical thing. It was always a technical thing to kind of this incident response teams were always like, Get me rid, get rid of the fire, put it back to normal. That's it. And now we are kind of having all this critical infrastructure, data privacy stuff coming on top of it, where it, where it's not good enough to just put out the fire. You have to kind of tell people what happened, in language they kind of understand and stuff. So, yeah. So if your lawyer can understand it, the people can probably also understand it. <laughs> True. Yep. Yeah. No, but otherwise, yeah, I think, but it really depends in what company or what institution you're working for. So what kind of data you are protecting, it, it really differs, I would say. I mean, our company is a bit special, I would say. Um, if you're working for a, a manufacturing company with which is not handling huge amount of data, only kind of your, your customer's data, your supplier's data, and maybe your employees, that's a different story. But I yeah. think for a software company, it will even change more in the future. I'm quite convinced. Yo. Okay. No more time for questions. Thank you, Chris and Kerstin. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>